Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club's virtual program. I'm Sukinder Sinkasti, the president of StubHub, and I'm excited to get started this evening as your moderator. I also get to bang the very famous and nifty gavel of the Commonwealth Club to uh, put us into order. Uh, presently, the Commonwealth Club, as you know, has, has suspended its in-person programming, but continues with its virtual programs, including this one. You can learn more about our virtual events and the upcoming schedule by becoming a member or visiting www.commonwealthclub.org. We're grateful, of course, for the generous support of donors and members, and hope you'll consider a membership by donating online or texting to the number that you see on your screen. We'd also encourage you to, of course, subscribe and like these videos and share them with your friends and family. During our program, we'll have time for your questions, so please uh, submit those in the chat box, a box, and we'll be happy to get to them. Now it's my pleasure to introduce a friend of mine, Alex Kantrowitz, who's the senior technology uh, reporter at BuzzFeed News and the author of Always Day One, How the Tech Titans Plan to Stay on Top Forever. Alex was part of the team that won the Mirror Award in 2019 for its reporting on social media in the crosshairs. And his work, of course, has been referenced by numerous media publications from The New Yorker to The Wall Street Journal and more. Alex is a graduate of the Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Welcome, Alex. Good to have you. Thank you. It's good to be here. And Sekinder, I, I know that you are a veteran of both Google and Amazon. And uh, for a conversation about the tech giants, I couldn't think of a better person to have this discussion with. So bring the heat, please. Uh, well, I'm going to bring it and it's going to be fun. Right. Um, so look, let's get started. Always Day One has a pretty mighty name. But for those people who don't know the origins, uh, some of us do and some of us don't, uh, why don't you just explain what Always Day One means and where it originated? So Always Day One is a line that Jeff Bezos uses. And when I first heard it, I thought, this is hustle porn. This is telling Amazon employees to work their days and nights and weekends. And if they don't, they'll get fired. Because if you think about day two, then you're toast. And you got to keep working as if it's your first day. The actual meaning is a little bit deeper, though. It, for At Amazon, as you know, Always Day One means inventing as if it was your first day. So a lot of big companies, they get big and they um, become attached to their flagship product and they can't even think of building something else because their culture completely focuses on protecting that asset. Mm -hmm. And what Amazon has done so well has been to reinvent itself over and over and over again. It really comes in every day as if it's their first and doesn't really worry about how will this business impact our core business. And when you're able to come to work with that type of mentality, all of a sudden you can become a company that goes from a online bookstore to a uh, clearinghouse of just about every product in the world to a third party marketplace where your third party merchants are competing with your first party merchants to a cloud services provider, a voice computing platform, you know, not to mention a hardware manufacturer, a grocer, and uh, an Academy Award winning movie studio. So by coming in every day as if it's their first and not really worrying how it's going to impact their legacy businesses. Amazon's been able to reinvent itself over and over and over again. And, you know, in our economy today, the average company on the Fortune 500 lasts about 15 years there. Mm -hmm. In uh, the 1920s, it was 67 years. Mm -hmm. So why is that? It's because we're moving so fast. And I believe that companies today need to learn how to reinvent themselves to keep up with the times. Otherwise, they're just going to end up being, as Bezos says, in day two. And the way he puts it is it's stasis followed by irrelevance, followed by slow, painful decline, followed by death. So keeping it always day one seems to be a pretty good strategy uh, for the modern time. Well, there are a couple of things you said in there. First of all, thinking about irrelevance and death, it is, uh, it is actually something that startups think about all the time. So even always day one is obviously how startups live. But I think the most interesting thing about this book is it's how the giants live, right? And how they have been able so far uh, to keep inventing. Um, I also have to say, I really love the phrase hustle porn. I may use that <laughs> phrase. That's a pretty good one. Um, there's, there's plenty of it on YouTube. You can just Google. I'll give you a few names afterwards. Okay. You can watch their videos. They say you got to work 24-7. You can't take your foot off the gas pedal. Um, and they're, of course, all wrong. So Yeah, well, I, as I said, hustle porn is a good name. But um, I want to come back to a couple of other things that are in the book. And as for, I think you're aware, I actually spent the early part of my career at Amazon for just a year. Um, and in fact, just to come back to this point about always day one, what you say is true. I was part of an acquisition that uh, Jeff Bezos uh, bought, the company Jungly, that was the 0, 0.0 attempt at Amazon Marketplace in 1998. And it's staggering if you think even back then that he had a vision for marketplace when he hadn't even begun to build out retail categories on Amazon. And when I say we were like really uh, uh, welcomed by Jeff, 
But the re- lots of other Amazonians were like, what are you all doing here? Like, we're supposed to build a gardening mm-hmm. category. We're supposed to build a toys category. How could it be that you're going to launch a marketplace before we've even had a chance to do retail well yet? Um, it's certainly a testament to how Jeff was thinking 22 years ago about marketplace. I mean, it's, that's just remarkable to me. Um, there's a phrase though you use in the bo- book, before I come back to Always Day One, and how it applies not just to Amazon, but how other giants you mentioned, and we'll talk about have stayed on top. But there's another phrase you coin, which is the engineer's mindset. You know, we're all used in, in the valley and beyond, now having um, sort of become enamored of the term, the growth mindset, the growth mindset. Mm-hmm. But you've coined a new phrase, which is really engineer's mindset, and identify that Amazon and the other big giants in the book, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, effectively Apple, and Microsoft, all effectively, uh, most of them, not all, have adopted this engineer's mindset. So can you talk about what that is, and is it really just applicable, uh, can it be applicable to non-engineers? Right. So I would say the engineer's mindset is not something that's only the domain of engineers. It's something that everybody can use, whether you're an engineer or a salesperson. Mm -hmm. But if you're a salesperson, you're going to have to start thinking a little bit differently. So here's a story. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to be in sales. That's where I started my career before I went into journalism. And the way to get an idea to a decision maker if you're in sales is to tell your boss. Mm -hmm. And then your boss tells their boss. And their boss tells their boss. And you play this terrible game of telephone all the way up to the line. And if somebody says no, well, sorry, your idea is not going to be brought to life. In an engineering organization, what happens if you have an idea, you just go right to the decision maker and say, hey, you know, this is something we should build. Let's get on it. And there are different ways that engineers apply this in their organizations. And so for me, when I talk about the engineer's mindset, it's because the CEOs of Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, and we'll talk about Apple later, but at least those four have built pathways inside their organizations for people to bring their ideas to decision makers and then bring those ideas to life. You know, I just mentioned that in this world, we have a, a, a average time span on the Fortune 500, 15 years, as opposed to yeah, 67 in the 1920s, right? A hundred years ago, you'd last your whole lifetime on the, on the on Fortune 500. On one idea, 500. effectively on exactly. one idea, right? Perfected. Today, you're, you need to be able to reinvent over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And there's a problem, especially here in Silicon Valley, where the people that lead companies believe they need to be the visionary. Mm -hmm. They need to be the one that has all the ideas and they need to be the one the company lives and dies on. And I think what the leaders of of these tech giants do very well, what's enabled them to keep on top is they know they need to reinvent. Mm -hmm. And they know that in order to reinvent, they need to harness the ingenuity of their employees. And to do that, they employ this engineer's mindset. Again, you don't need to be an engineer to do it, but you need to be able to think like an engineer to make sure that your uh, organization isn't playing this harmful game of telephone, but finding and building the systems to bring the, uh, your employees' ideas to reality so you'll be able to reinvent and keep up with the times. Yeah, and look, I think you make a couple of good points that I want to come back to. First of all, I've spent the majority of my career in sales, so certainly, you know, the idea of sell a big, big vision is something mm-hmm. that sort of I learned my entire career. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, I think most of the Valley, particularly when you think about startups, does live this founder's mindset. If the founder's the visionary, the capital will come, you know, and that founder sort of is the oracle who sees around the corner. And I think one of the things the book really makes clear is that the giants have actually broken that mold in ways people don't realize. They presume all the best ideas come from Larry or from Sergey mm-hmm. or from Jeff. And so, you know, one of the things you told me uh, when we were uh, briefing or prepping for this was that on average, you interviewed something like 25 or 30 employees per company. And so if that's not really how these companies still tick, how would you identify the role that the CEO founder plays today in these companies? And when are they hands on the wheel, as you would call it in the book? And when are they hands off the wheel? Yeah. So again, I think that we've gotten into this weird place where we think the founder or the CEO needs to come up with all the ideas. I think it's sort sort of, you know, Steve Jobs reality distortion field that's just applied to everybody else. And so I do think that um, the CEO has a role and it's not visionary, Mm -hmm. it's facilitator. Mm -hmm. Find the ideas within the organization and bring them to life. Mm -hmm. But now this is sort of a, a, a crazy idea because Typically, when you're a CEO, you need to support the flagship product. Mm -hmm. So if a CEO is spending all their time building the next product, what's going to happen to the flagship product? And that's why I think the tech giants work very differently. You know, the the core of this book really is that the nature of work is going to change and the nature of the way we lead companies is going to change. And the reason why the tech giants are out ahead of the economy is they figured it out and they're now lapping the economy because of it. 
Um, and so I think that what they do is they look at work in two different categories. One is idea work. That's everything involved with coming up with a new idea and bringing it to life. The other is execution work, everything involved in supporting, a new pro supporting an existing product. Um, and I think that you know, we've gone through some stages in our lifetimes, right? In the industrial economy, everything was execution work. There would be a factory owner who would say, let's make widgets, and then everybody would be in the factory making widgets. We then moved to the knowledge economy. In the knowledge economy, we said, all of a sudden, employees' ideas matter. But what did we do? We still had them all working on execution work. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about an employee's day-to-day, -day, it's almost all spent on supporting existing products, not building new ones. And in fact, in most companies, there's a very specific people mm -hmm. of, uh, at the top of companies whose ideas are actually matter and are taken seriously. What I think the tech giants have done is they've used automation and artificial intelligence collaboration technology to minimize execution work inside their companies to make room for idea work. So a CEO can actually spend their time focusing on facilitating new ideas because the technology and leaders help put existing businesses on autopilot. Mm -hmm. Now you ask, when does a CEO end up getting involved in the existing business? Yep. The answer is when the shit hits the fan. Right now, in the middle of the COVID situation, it's not a time for a CEO to be thinking about building the next idea entirely mm -hmm. because everybody's existing businesses is one that, that um, deserves care and, and appreciation. And you need to guide the company to be able to adjust for the times. But in normal times, CEO puts the existing business on autopilot using this technology and good lieutenants, and they can focus on facilitating the next ideas. Well, it's one of the things that you did in the book is you juxtapose, of course, these large giants, right, again, and um, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. And we're going to talk about the ways in which they're similar and the ways in which they're different. So maybe start by uh, identifying in what ways do you think that they are similar? I would love to, if you were to pull out from your interviews, the collective wisdom on like, what are the three or four things that uh, they uniquely do that are, em, you know, em, uh, things you can emulate if you're a startup CEO, if you're running a non-tech business, where did, where did you find the common threads? So they're not too precious about their existing businesses. That's number one. So there's this constant willingness to reinvent, even if, you know, it's going to cost them uh, you know, Can I challenge that for a moment, though? Yeah, is it possible it. they're not too precious about their existing business because their existing business models are like one in a million business models, at least in the case of Facebook or Google, that they have a luxury to do that? Is that possible? It's possible, but I have to say that there's a ticking timer on it. And I'll give you an example. Okay. Microsoft. Mm-hmm which is one of my favorite chapters in the book. We initially didn't even have Microsoft in the proposal, but it was so interesting mm -hmm. that we said, okay, we got to include this in the book because I think it's the ultimate case study of what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft was precious about its existing business. Windows. And yeah. that was Windows, the desktop operating system. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were people inside Microsoft that said, we have an asset and our asset is the desktop operating system and we are kicking everybody else's butt when mm -hmm. it comes to this. And our job running this company is to make sure we get the most out of that asset possible. That worked really well for a while. In fact, Microsoft was incredibly profitable under Steve Ballmer. Mm -hmm. The problem is it missed the future. Mm -hmm. You know, while mobile was coming to be, Microsoft was still focused on this desktop operating system. Mm -hmm. So the iPhone comes out, Ballmer laughs at it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he was, not because he didn't think mobile was going to happen, he was so focused on protecting that core asset, he couldn't get his act together for the future state. Mm -hmm. By the time uh, Microsoft realized it had become a joke, I think that the mobile opportunity had passed them by. But there was still opportunity, in, you know, that looking ahead, it was just not going to be mobile anymore. Right. For them, what it was going to be was cloud. And cloud, to me, is such an interesting example when it comes to Microsoft. And I'm going to try to tell it in the least geeky way possible. Okay. Because when people talk about cloud, they can start you know, getting down this Geeking rabbit up. hole. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't work in cloud, all of a sudden, you're just right. not into it. But all right, let me tell it for a broader audience. So cloud is, is um, supporting programs that exist on the web browser versus the ones you install mm -hmm. on your computer. So if you're a desktop operating system, you hate the cloud. Mm -hmm. Because if someone can use programs on, any, uh, on a browser, they can access them on any machine, whether it's a Windows machine or an Apple's, Apple machine or a Chromebook. Mm -hmm. When you support the cloud, all of a sudden you say, actually the desktop operating system doesn't really matter. It's the browser, which is where all the computing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the way Microsoft was able to become relevant again was to reinvent itself mm -hmm. and say, we're not gonna be precious about this very important asset, Windows. We're going to enable the very thing that's going to blow Windows up mm -hmm. in cloud. And so Satya Nadella, who yes. took over after Bomber, 
put his foot on the gas pedal when it came to cloud. And he grew Azure from almost nothing, which is Microsoft's cloud service yeah. offering, to a very powerful challenger to Amazon Web Services. And that's brought Microsoft back to relevance. So I do think that you know you can rely on your existing business for a while and it's gonna feel good and you'll make money, mm -hmm. but that is temporary. And as the case of Microsoft plays out, uh, it's just obvious that their ability to reinvent and cast aside what brought them to the game is what's going to bring them to the next point of their existence. Look, so Satya is, of course, a great example because he took sort of one of the macro tailwinds of tech and wrote it all the way to the, you know, to the CEO seat at Microsoft, right? I incredibly well, to your point. Um, I want to come to the ways in which these companies are different because when you read the book, and again, I haven't been at all five, but I've been at two of the companies profiled in the book, Google for five years and Amazon for a shorter time earlier in my career. Um, it makes it sound uh, like they're similar in many ways, but there's some very distinct differences in culture. In fact, one could say that Amazon even today is seen as probably the most ruthless place to work. As you know, if you looked at the old New York Times article that suggested mm -hmm. you know that employees were miserable, whether true or not, and it appears that Microsoft and Google and Facebook are kinder, gentler versions of their former selves. So true, not true, and how would you juxtapose the cultures of these companies? Because um, some teams seem to have an edge and some potentially maybe have less edge than you think. Is that true? Yeah. So I, I think the New York Times article that you're referencing says that Amazon employees would regularly cry at their desk. Right. I, I, I think, unfortunately, in America, mm -hmm. we have employees crying at their desks at every company. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, I, I'm a reporter, I kind of know how this goes. Yeah. If you call around, you can get employees saying they cry at their desk no matter where they are. That's true. In you my know? 20s, I cried at my desk at multiple companies. Yeah, trust me, when I get <laughs> yeah. beat on a story or my editor says, where is yeah. this? You're, you're off deadline. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, the tears are flowing right out. Yeah, yeah. So no, someone I, can write the story uh, about yeah, BuzzFeed. I agree. We yeah. all can cry at our desks. Uh, so I do think that's really manager specific. But I do think there are also di uh, really true distinct differences between the company. I mean, Amazon, as Charles Duhigg put it in his New Yorker article about Jeff Bezos, is a process company. Mm -hmm. They are so process driven. And they bring in MBAs and they interview them behaviorally. So they have these 14 leadership principles. Mm -hmm. And if you fit the leadership principles, then you're an Amazonian. And mm -hmm. if you don't, go find another company. Right. Facebook is the cult of Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. You're there to learn from Mark mm -hmm. and to have access to him. Mm -hmm. And that can be great for some people. He is very smart. No one will ever take that away from him. He really knows what's going on, in, in especially the social media world. And he's, really, uh, he's plugged in on other forms of computing as well. Um, so when you go to Facebook, you're there to learn from Mark and you have more access to him than anybody does to the CEOs at the other companies. Mm -hmm. Sundar is the great, I would call him the great integrator. Mm -hmm. You know, he's able to um, connect employees from all different parts of the Google organization together. Um, so when you're at Google, you get this really great cross-functional understanding of what's happening uh, inside the company. And chances are you're going to be paired with someone on another team or people on multiple other teams to build something like the Google Assistant, which took, you know, Android and search and maps and YouTube and, you know, the list goes on. Apple is is uh, a place, you know, at least from my reporting, that doesn't seem very happy. Uh, it, it's a place where you'll learn how to refine. So if you really want to learn how to make a battery uh, last longer and you're on the battery life team, you'll get really good at that. But also inside Apple, I think that there is a unfortunate underutilization of many employees there. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be upset because they say, hey, I was hired to, into Apple. I'm pretty freaking talented. Mm -hmm. Why am I not on a project that suits the level of my abilities, which is the case in almost all the other tech giants? Microsoft is like a it's a B2B you know, enterprise culture, mm -hmm. okay? Everybody who's interacted with these worlds kind of has an idea yep. what, what that's like. Let me paint the picture. <laughs> uh, you know, 50-year-old men run the place. Uh, they, they uh, you know, wear a blue shirt and khaki pants, tuck the shirt in and have a, um, their phone in their, in their front pocket here. Mm -hmm. um, Satya has made some moves to uh, move that culture, which was predominant under Balmer, mm -hmm. to a more friendly, inclusive culture. Still work to do. Mm -hmm. I think the people at Microsoft will willingly tell you that, uh, but it's improved. So these, these cultures, they all have a very distinct feel to them. But ultimately, at the core, I think, except for Apple, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm yeah, sure you're going to ask there. me some questions yes, about it. Sure. What they're really good at is, again, reinventing, making room for idea work, and minimizing execution work, and then building the systems to get their employees' ideas to life. So whether you're at Apple, no, sorry, 
let's not say that. Whether you're at Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft, if you have an idea and you bring it to the, um, you know, you can you have a system that's going to get it very serious consideration um, before there's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And this definitely beats that old, you know, bring the idea up the chain and then get it lost and then ultimately reject it. Well, I, I want to, uh, there's so much to talk about. So we're mm. going to talk about three different things. Um, I want to go a little deeper on Google. We certainly can go deeper on Apple. And I want to come back to this question of culture. Um, so let's talk about Google and culture and then, Am and then Apple. Um, it's interesting that you say that Sundar is the great integrator. And I agree with you. Interestingly, I met Sundar when he first came to the company mm -hmm. in 2003, 2004, and was trying to decide which group to join. Uh, and he ultimately ended up joining Marissa and working on Toolbar and then Chrome, though I met him when I was the GM for Google Local and maps. And mm -hmm. I was trying to get Sundar <laughs> to come work on my, uh, on maps and, uh, and local. And as I said, he picked a different project on his entry. But there is no doubt that um, the world has changed under Sundar. When I think about Google in the early days, there was, there was something called Googliness. I think mm -hmm. they still try and define that, right? But this sort of notion that sort of you are kind of have your own personality and interests and, you know, uh, kind of you're exceptional across many different fronts, but you're your own kind of unique character. There was something that, they, that Google would call Googliness. Um, but part of the essence of Googliness was that, you know, you would speak up and that you wanted to sort of bring your ideas forth. I think even then that existed. I think what Sundar did so well, which you identify is in the era I was at Google, which is really 2003 to 2009, it was both a very decentralized place. I remember trying to be the GM of local and maps. And honestly, neither Eric nor Larry nor Sergey would uh, run interference and tell me what that meant. I had a title and then I had to corral all these people. So that sort of culture of collaboration in everybody and everybody's business existed when I was there. The converse was there was also a lot of tribalism. It was like survival of the fittest. You had a lot of really strong personalities as leaders. And when I look at uh, what Sundar has done so beautifully in the last few years, it is true that Sundar has integrated even at the leadership level and promoted some of the strongest leaders in the company, like Susan Wojcicki, right, mm -hmm. who herself, I think, was an integrator. So I think he's also created a culture of integrators um, and in some way done away with some of the fiefdoms that used to exist at Google. So I would agree with that. But let's come to this notion of culture. So Googliness or Amazonian. I don't know if Microsoft has a word for what you are, if you're, if you know, if you're quintessentially uh, belong at Microsoft or Facebook has a word. But do you believe in this idea that there are cultures where you either fit or you should leave and that all of the tech giants um, have sort of the same ringer, if you will? Like, how do you think about this idea of culture? And do you have to sort of make yourself fit a culture or, or does the culture adapt to you? So look, I think that culture matters. Mm -hmm. um, but my perspective on what makes a healthy culture is very different from the way that we typically think about culture. So people in these, about these tech giants, what do they think about when they think about the culture? They think about the water slides at Google or the, the micro food. kitchens, yes, the yes. food, right, you know, yes. the people wearing the hats with the spinning wheels on the top. Yep. Um, and I, I just think that that's not really what culture is about. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about the pyramid that Maslow built, yep. the hierarchy High of needs, needs. Yep. all that stuff that people think about when it comes to culture is on the bottom, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Food, shelter, <laughs> money. Stock options, yeah. the bottom. Right. What matters is the top. Mm -hmm. And so is there, like, if, if when companies are able to focus their employees on the top of that pyramid, mm -hmm. that's when their culture thrives. Mm -hmm. And what I think companies need to be doing is focusing mm -hmm. entirely on making sure they can have their employees self-actualizing by bringing ideas from the lower ranks mm -hmm. or the middle ranks mm -hmm. to the decision makers. Mm -hmm. And so this question of like, if you don't fit the culture, mm -hmm. you should leave. If that's what exists inside a company, they need to do away with that. Mm -hmm. That is a problem. Mm -hmm. It is on leaders to make sure that people feel comfortable inside the companies because ultimately they're not going to be there for the perks. Now, mm -hmm. look, anybody who's at these companies will talk about how they love the perks. Yep. I'm sure lots of people would say, sign me up for free lunch every day. Mm -hmm. But that's really not what's going to make people happy, nor is it what's going to make these companies mm -hmm. successful. So I think that companies need to focus, again, on the top of the pyramid. Yeah, That's are your ideas valued? Or is your work valued? Are you able to bring your ideas to the fore, right? Exactly. As opposed to sort of get your more basic needs met. That's right. And, and I believe that that's what Googliness mm -hmm. should be about. And that's what being an Amazonian should be about. Mm -hmm. That's what being a Facebooker should be about. That's what being an employee in any company should be should about. Be about. Yeah. When I come to work, are there going to be people? They're going to take my ideas seriously. Mm -hmm. And when they're good... Mm -hmm. turn them into reality. 
when a company is able to get good at this, it's going to thrive mm -hmm. because they really don't have a lot of runway otherwise. And if conversely, if they're not good at this and they focus on the bottom of that pyramid, focusing on, you know, are we giving people enough snacks? Did we do the happy hour? Mm -hmm. You're just going to have your eye on the totally wrong target. Mm -hmm. And that's when companies start to get into trouble. They think it's about the snacks mm -hmm. when it really should be about giving employees time to invent. Well, I think it's giving employees time to invent in a culture that is inclusive of their ideas, right? So mm -hmm. what you just defined, by the way, is the top of the pyramid on, on inclusivity, not just inventiveness. Oh, right? absolutely. That people yeah. feel that their ideas are heard and valued, right? And that they're free to bring them forth, right? To your point, there are there is the Maslow hierarchy of needs definition of inclusiveness as well, right? Which is like, you can do the token stuff. What people really want to know is when they're in a room, are mm -hmm. their ideas valued and heard? Absolutely. And do they free, feel free to bring them forth? Yeah, can I, can I build on that for a second? So sure. I, I think that, um, you know, you can have this, we value your ideas mm -hmm. in, in your corporate communications materials. Yep. You can say, please give your ideas in the folder that you give to employees in orientation. Yep. But the only way people are actually going to advance their ideas mm -hmm. is when they get permission to mm -hmm. do it. I totally so agree. at Amazon, you know, their leadership principles, there's 14 of them. You know, people follow them more closely than their own religion. They teach them to their kids. When an Amazonian marries another Amazonian, they start yeah. evaluating their marriage based off of the leadership principles. <laughs> You know, I guess the kids would be customers or we have customer obsession, you know, anyway. No, but, it's true. And I mean, interestingly, mm -hmm. this is one of the things I would observe. Yeah. Of all the distinctive cultures, I think all right. the giants still have strong mm -hmm. cultures. Amazon seems to have still the most distinctive culture, even yeah. among the giants. From yeah, what I've it, seen. it's super distinct. And so why has Amazon been able to reinvent itself over and over again? It's not but because they have think big mm -hmm. in their manual or invent and simplify, mm -hmm. which is... Again, this is them giving permission on paper for mm -hmm. employees to invent. It's because they take these leadership principles and they live them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you have an idea inside Amazon, you don't go through telephone. Right. You actually are told, write it down, mm -hmm. no matter what the rank you are. Right. And that idea, that process of writing an idea down gets your unvarnished, comprehensive idea mm -hmm. from where you are down on the totem pole to a decision maker. Mm -hmm. And then you're really able to be in prime time. So the process... And the leadership principles are something inside the company that make people believe they have the pro they have the, the permission to invent. Mm -hmm. And like as you mentioned, you know, it's not just some people. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you're somebody inside the company and you're not told to write something down, yep. you know something's wrong. Yeah. Yes. And by by modeling this behavior, not just writing it down on like the, the mm -hmm. Ten Commandments, you know, uh, when you walk in the door, that's that's when you end up, you know being able to build a culture that's inventive. Yeah, and inventive at scale, right? That's mm. the remarkable thing, I think, that speaks to the title of the book. Um, what is remarkable of the Giants is their uh, inventiveness at scale. It's just, it's extraordinary. Yeah, um, big companies shouldn't be able to invent to do like do what this. they're doing, right? I like mean, big companies typically, right? What happens to a big company usually? They just get Basis. slow and ossified, and then they fall apart. It's just yeah. the cycle of life. Right, but and, and, and to be clear... Mm -hmm. We see it even more than ever with public companies, activism, short-termism. I mm -hmm. mean, that problem it is not going away. And there's a gigantic juxtaposition mm -hmm. of, I would say, the tech giants versus uh, the rest of the sort of large corporate ecosystem. So now let's talk about Apple. Okay. Because the book is very fascinating and actually balanced. And we're going to talk about the ills of the tech giants because we can't really have this conversation without talking about what goes wrong. But before that... Uh, your feelings are very markedly different about mm -hmm. Apple based on your interviews there. And you call Apple a refinement culture, not an engineering, you know, an engineering driven culture, right? Or a refinement mm -hmm. mindset. Um, so what do you, I mean, if you had to diagnose Apple and what's coming next, what would you say? So I don't think Apple is going to be capable of reinventing itself over to the next evolution of technology if it keeps its culture the way it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that's a controversial statement, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think the company has the processes in place that will give uh, their employees the ability to work on something big together mm -hmm. that's not the iPhone. So I call it a refinement culture. And this is, again, based on reporting. It's not just me taking pot shots. It's mm -hmm. actually speaking to the people who are inside the company. Mm -hmm. And what happens is Apple has its employees work on refining the iPhone because we spoke about Windows, the yeah. asset inside Microsoft, inside Apple, that they eventually moved by beyond. Mm -hmm. Inside Apple, the asset is the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And its employees are put in silos and told to make the specific part of the iPhone that they work on better. Mm -hmm. You're there to make the battery life better. Mm -hmm. you're, you're there to make the glass shinier. It's extreme specialization. Yes, exactly. And as one person put it to me, they're there so experts can be experts. Mm -hmm. 
So if you are, let's say you're the processor person, mm -hmm. you don't speak to the glass person, mm -hmm. right? You're just doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. And I actually spoke to someone who worked on uh, the HomePod, mm -hmm. which is Apple's answer to uh, answer yeah, to an assistant, Echo, assistant, yeah, to yep. the Echo and to the Google Home. This person didn't even see what the HomePod looked like until he saw a box sitting in somebody else's office well into the project. And he said, hey, what's that? And then the person said, that's the HomePod. And I think there's a problem mm -hmm. with not allowing these divisions to integrate with, mm -hmm. with themselves. It's worked wonderfully for the iPhone. Mm -hmm. But eventually we're going to move to another evolution of technology, just like Microsoft mm -hmm. thought we would be living in a Windows world forever, and we really weren't. I think that if Apple thinks we're just going to be living in an iPhone world forever, mm -hmm. it's mistaken. And uh, the, the best example I can give is Siri, mm -hmm. right? Because... You know, now instead of like typing and tapping on phones and computers, some people actually talk to their computers, mm -hmm. right? So that's an action taken, you know, through a voice computing as opposed to an Apple computer. Yep. And this isn't very important for Apple. Apple needs to figure out how to get good mm -hmm. at voice computing. And what's happened is uh, the Siri team has been siloed away. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I, so if you're building a voice assistant, this is an operating system mm -hmm. essentially for the voice web. So you need to be able to plug into all the different applications. So ideally, if you're inside Apple, you have your voice assistant team moving between everybody mm -hmm. and saying, hey, how would your programs be best accessible if people were going to speak to them? And uh, it doesn't happen. And that's why Apple gave Google and, and Amazon a five, six year head start mm -hmm. on Alexa and the Google Assistant. And let's be honest, Siri sucks right now. A lot of room for improvement. The other two are doing great. Well, it's interesting. I think um, I'm going to go to questions mm -hmm. from our audience in just a moment, but I think there are a couple of things about Apple. So is your hypothesis that Apple, Apple needs to be quintessentially more open, i.e., you know, Microsoft is a far more collaborative and open culture, again, mm -hmm. because of this integration that's needed across products. So is Google. I don't know that Amazon is necessarily an open culture. It seems like it's a culture that also has sort of many different autonomous divisions, and it actually values autonomy. But is your, is your hypothesis that Apple needs to be more, quote unquote, open? I think what Apple needs to do, you know, whether they decide to build a collaboration culture or figure out another way to do it, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, they need to appreciate ideas from everywhere. So, uh, you know, when I spoke to um, uh, employees at, at Amazon and Microsoft and Google and Facebook, I asked all of them the same question. How would you get your ideas to leadership? Mm -hmm. They all had an answer. Mm -hmm. Then I asked an Apple product manager, how would you get an ideas, your ideas to leadership? She laughed at me. I'm chuckling. Like no one would ever... I'm chuckling because I've read yeah, this part of the book. <laughs> exactly. What do you mean? No one would ever bring our ideas to Tim Cook. It's just not how it works. And I, I again, like, you know, if you have like Steve Jobs at the helm of the company, mm -hmm. maybe you can get past an evolution or two. And certainly Apple did going from the desktop computer to the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think um, Scott Galloway, who we both know, mm -hmm. says, uh, you know, one thing you should do in life is assume you're not Steve Jobs because you're most likely not him. <laughs> And the Apple uh, uh, leadership at the top is still modeled after Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think if they're not going to listen to the product managers, they're going to miss where technology is moving. And that ultimately will hinder them in the long run. Well, I think it's, uh, I, like I said, Apple is one of the more fascinating stories in the book. Mm. For, um, for those of you who, uh, who buy the book, it's really a great read. Um, I'm going to go to questions from the web. So uh, someone asked, which is a question I was going to come to, so let's get to it. How will tech companies plan to stay on top in this COVID world? And if you could take that one further, because um, I know both you and mm. I would agree that the tech company giants that we're talking about had a lot of, got a lot of heat uh, pre-COVID. And it seems like COVID is also an opportunity for redemption for them. But let's take that question broader. I mean, how do these companies operate uh, uh, in a world of COVID? Uh, what are their opportunities or challenges? And how do you think about that? So I believe that Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft have an amazing opportunity right now in the age of COVID. Mm -hmm. They can become more essential than they ever have before, but it's not going to happen automatically. What these companies need to do is realize that they are in a position that many of them could never dream about. Amazon, mm -hmm. right? We're all in our homes. Oh my God. Yes. And could Amazon dream of a better situation for its business, however unfortunate it may be, mm -hmm. than people saying, I can't go out to a store, but Amazon can deliver this to my home? Mm -hmm. Facebook and Google, key conduits of information to people. You know, Scott Galloway in his book, The Four, says, Google is like God. Mm -hmm. People used to ask God, mm -hmm. you know, God, when will my kid get better? <laughs> Now they go, Google, when will my kid get better? Um, 
so so both those companies are are trusted sources of information for people for better or worse right they must provide the most accurate information and microsoft mm -hmm. right microsoft is now a very important pillar underneath mm -hmm. the internet for a lot of companies by providing cloud services mm -hmm. they're also collaborate like providing collaboration yeah, software absolutely great opportunity for them they got to make sure that they cater to their users and then apple of course is going to be a key component uh, in the contact tracing that we're about to have uh, in the U.S. So just pushing on mm -hmm. that, do you think that these companies are getting their redemptive moment where they're seen as sort of saviors in COVID versus their previous sort of villainous, you know, reputations among regulators? Yeah, I think that they can redeem themselves. There's certainly an opportunity to redeem themselves. Mm -hmm. If Amazon is able to step in and not only provide this critical retail function, but give third-party merchants an ability to reach people in a way that they're not able to otherwise, it could be a great success story. Mm -hmm. And Bezos can be hailed as somebody that has really you know, stepped in when needed. But that doesn't happen automatically. They need to care for worker safety. Mm -hmm. If you have Amazon employees that are dying inside fulfillment centers, all that goodwill is gone. Right. The tech clash will feel like a walk in the park compared mm -hmm. to what Amazon's going to go through if it doesn't protect it's, it's only worker essential safety. workers, effectively. Exactly. Facebook and Google. If we start seeing bad information show up mm -hmm. inside of these platforms, yeah, they, will, gonna, they will quickly oh be my a Oh, God. Can back. you imagine? Mm -hmm. Cambridge Analytica, they're going to be begging for Cambridge Analytica and the other horrors that went on, you know, with people manipulating their platforms in 2016. If people end up using their, their uh, services... And, you know, taking bad medication, for instance, and killing themselves. Yeah. So, look, you're pointing to uh, both sides of this issue, right, which is um, even more essential in times of COVID, mm. yet the backlash for bad behavior, inappropriate behavior, right, uh, not watching for health, safety of their audiences, their workers, what have you, really becomes an even bigger risk. Yeah. And to build on that, like, there's been this meme that, okay, the tech clash is over, the tech giants have stepped in. Yeah. So short-sighted, like it's like you know. Okay, was the tech uh, tech clash a little overblown? Mm -hmm. Quite possibly. Mm -hmm. I think that um, some journalists kind of went, you know, buck wild, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, probably should have been a little more nuanced in their coverage. Yeah. I think overall it was mostly fair. Um, but like you know, I think that right now to just say okay, you know, right. Facebook redemption good. is here. The same right. people saying Facebook was bad, and they're like. Facebook is good now. Right. You know, I, I, I think that like you have to, n none of these companies are entitled to like a, a free ride here. Like mm -hmm. they, 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 do they provide essential services? Yes. Are they a net positive? Probably so. Mm -hmm. But they, they need to be able to do this responsibly. Mm -hmm. And you know, the reporters that are, that are working on these stories, you know, can't, can't say all of a sudden, you know, everything's, you know, fine and dandy. Uh, I think there's a responsibility to continue to scrutinize. Well, you picked up the word responsibility, and I want to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to go back to audience questions. Uh, do, you think the, uh, do you think the tech companies are uh, able to self-regulate and uh, set their own responsible uh, limits on mm -hmm. their own power uh, or how much they want to give philanthropically or what have you? I mean, do you believe they can self-regulate? In our current system, no. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. I think the FTC is chronically underfunded. Mm -hmm. And so why would companies self-regulate? Mm -hmm. It's because they're afraid that mm -hmm. they might get regulated otherwise. So what they'll do is they'll model the good behavior that the government was going to force them into anyway. Mm -hmm. Without a strong FTC, there's no threat. Mm -hmm. Without a strong justice department, there's no threat. And right now they're operating with no threat. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they will continue to do what they want to do. A lot uh, of noise, but you're saying yeah. no ultimate threat. No, what I'd like to see is, you know, we had this whole debate go on, you know, and we might see more of it. Mm -hmm. Um, where candidates are, are being asked, should you break up the tech giants or, you know, how should you regulate them? I didn't see one candidate say, if I'm elected, what I'm going to do is fund our regulatory agencies to let them do our work. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that should be, that should be what um, the stance is. It. All right. So let's go to some other audience questions. Somebody wants to go back to Facebook. Thoughts on Facebook. Is it still very hierarchical under Mark and, and Cheryl? I don't think it's a hierarchical. Yeah, you, know, you, you actually would, right. Yeah. You would say that's actually not the truth of what it's like. It's super flat. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I took a feedback training yes. inside Facebook. Yep. And, you know, feedback often, so they have a feedback culture. Yep. And, and feedback often, people think about feedback as, oh, you should really let your employees know where they stand mm -hmm. so they won't be surprised mm -hmm. by the time they get to their evaluation. I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I really think that's the completely the wrong way to look about feedback. I think what a feedback culture should do is make people feel comfortable sharing ideas with people no matter their rank, no matter their division. Mm -hmm. And it should also make people feel comfortable receiving ideas from anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so look, the feedback trainings, they're grueling. Mm -hmm. They're super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I wanted to melt in my seat during mm -hmm. these simulations that they had us do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they're tough. Mm -hmm. But what they do is they teach people inside Facebook to take ideas uh, uh, from anywhere and then bring them to reality. Mm -hmm. And I have multiple stories in the book where you know Zuckerberg initially was dead set on one direction. An employee came to him and said, you're doing it wrong. And he said, oh, okay. And then eventually, uh, you know, decided to go with it. And it's actually kind of fun because I spoke with those employees and then I met with Zuckerberg and was able to bring their idea, you know, mm -hmm. how did this conversation go? And he gave me some color in the book. So I don't think Facebook is, as is a hierarchical place. Mm -hmm. what, what I do think, and I think some stories recently have pointed this out, is that Facebook is a Mark Zuckerberg place. Mm -hmm. But anybody can get to Mark Zuckerberg to ask him a question or to share an idea on a product. And I think many people down the line outside Facebook have had time and, and meetings with him. So I think he's pretty accessible. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, is he going to take everybody's ideas and everybody's advice? No. Mm -hmm. Like that's not a job as CEO. I don't believe is to take everyone's idea. Mm -hmm. It's to sort through the ideas mm -hmm. and then settle on the ones that work the best. And find a way to accelerate them. them. Exactly. That's right. Elevate them, accelerate them. Uh, I, look, I, I often say the CEO's job is to be um, author and publisher, meaning mm -hmm. there are times as a CEO, you author, right? You have a purview and a perspective that uh, may give you ideas as well. And oftentimes you really need to be publisher, which is really finding the best ideas and figuring out how to get them elevated and out the door, right? Exactly. Um, so I think it's both. All right. So let's come to another question. Most of the companies you've talked about are based out in Silicon Valley. Can you describe the cultural differences between those located here and elsewhere? So is this all just the secret, you know, sauce of Silicon Valley some, somehow? Or are there examples we can find from places outside of the valley yeah. that really point to it in a positive way? Yeah, I don't think this is Silicon Valley exclusive. And I will point out that two companies are in Seattle. And I think the two strongest companies are in Seattle, which mm -hmm. is uh, Amazon and, and Microsoft. So like if you, you know, if you told me bet on Silicon Valley, like Facebook, Google, Apple, or you told me bet on Seattle, I might go Seattle. I think mm -hmm. those companies are, are pretty strong. And I spent a bunch of time in Seattle for the book. And I'm pretty impressed with the tech ecosystem there. Just as long as you're not betting on the Seahawks. You that's right. The no, Bay no. Area for, yeah. Well, I'm not uh, even going to talk sports. about my football affiliation oh, that's because true. You can't, you're I'm a long uh, suffering Jets fan. And I was going to say, yes, but it's ta taught me to build some character, but okay, here, here's some examples of companies that are not in Silicon Valley that, that have started to think like them. Yes, exactly. I think that's what it's, people um, are looking for. Yeah. Some it's a uh, uh, COVID related. Yeah. So I think, cause this has really caused a lot of companies to think, well, I can't be precious about my flagship business. I have to reinvent. Yep. So my favorite example is a company called flying elephant in Ireland. Okay. They were a uh, stage builder and props builder for events. They very quickly realized that there weren't going to be any events going on for the foreseeable future, and their business was toast if they continued to rely on it. Mm -hmm. So somebody came into the office and asked them to build a desk. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, sure, we'll give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Because that person was working from home, and they didn't like the fact that they were like sitting on the couch and their mm -hmm. back was hurting. And they're like, oh, we did a pretty good job with the desk. So they became a desk builder for people in Ireland wow. that were working from home. In a month, they built 2,000 desks, mm -hmm. saved the business. Now, they're working on sanitizer stations mm -hmm. where they're put in open places and, you know, whatever big organizations will put the sanitizer in. And now they're going to fulfill a role there. Mm -hmm. So they're able to survive because they've had uh, this willingness to, one, reinvent, two, take ideas from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Another great example is a company called Framebridge, which is based in D.C. It's mm -hmm. a, a custom framing company. Okay. And they, you know, had a big retail expansion planned for this year. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's canceled. Um, but they looked at their supplies and they said, well, we have acrylic mm -hmm. and we have acrylic cutters. And there's a massive shortage in face shields right now for essential workers. We're not going to be anywhere be near the for, volume right, right. that we need. What if we figured out how to make face shields? That's amazing. And again, it was one employee that read an article and brought it to the, the CEO. And so away they went. They built a prototype and they just had an order for 30000 from the state of Kentucky. And they're, they're selling them at cost, but that includes labor costs. So they're able to keep their employees uh, working. And when things go back to normal, they'll just be able to kick, kick right back up. So I think companies anywhere can reinvent, can look elsewhere for ideas. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that the tech giants are uh, doing this better than anyone. Yeah. earlier than anyone, mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and they, I don't think they were going to tell anyone, Right. but I, I thought I'd give it a shot. Well, we're, we're glad you did. So someone else has a, uh, a similar question, which is besides culture, which is important, of course, what are the other key ingredients that companies are leveraging to stay nimble? What about org design? So what are the other levers that you would point to besides culture to really create this? Uh, what, what might you do that's more systemic? 
Yeah, well, I use kind of I use culture as a way to think about organ or you know org design. Or design like, as well. Yeah. yeah, and again, there's like this this misnomer that culture is you know M and M's in the entryway, mm-hmm. and I really do think it's about how you you design organizations, which I go into detail in in the book, mm-hmm. uh, and then work you know get your employees to to work with each other. The one thing we haven't really talked about too much. Um, that, that they do that's important is they use technology yes. uh, in all different ways yep. to um, find ways to take their execution work down. Can I tell one quick story? Yes, of course. Amazon had a big, or, and you might be familiar with this because these were the people that you were competing against when you were building Marketplace. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a big organization of people called vendor managers. Mm-hmm. And the vendor manager is somebody inside Amazon. You can imagine, right? If you want to buy detergent from Amazon, it's got to get to a fulfillment center somehow mm-hmm. at a certain price at a certain time. And so Amazon had vendor managers on the phone with suppliers saying, hey, we need this many units of detergent and this many fulfillment centers at this time for this price. And this is how we'll promote them on the site. And at a time, vendor manager was one of the most prestigious jobs inside Amazon because it was pretty cool. You were spending your time, you know, working with people, exerting a pretty good amount of power and pressure on them, you know, to get their goods into Amazon fulfillment centers. Essentially, you were hot shit inside yeah, Amazon yeah, of if you were a vendor manager. Yeah, yeah. Then all of a sudden, Amazon looked at its data and said, oh, we have 20 plus years of retail data <laughs> and we can actually predict what people do in each zip code, you know, Replenishment, better than they do. Yes, exactly. why do you need a buyer? So when you, wanna, when, when you wanna buy something from Amazon, there's a good chance that the item that you want is already in the fulfillment center waiting to ship to you mm-hmm. before you hit buy mm-hmm. because Amazon knows that this demand, the demand is data. coming. Yeah, of course. And they say, well, why do we have all these vendor managers in the, in the company uh, if we can just automate this mm-hmm. using machine learning? So they did. And now, now, you know, when you typically hear this story, you think, well, they fired all the vendor managers, Mm -hmm. but that's not what happened. What happened was, if you look on LinkedIn, you can see a lot of Amazon vendor managers have gone on into the organization to become product managers and program managers, Mm -hmm. essentially professional inventors that work to shepherd new products from the beginning to life. Mm -hmm. And here's one one quick story to just tap it off, because I love this one. Uh, there was a guy inside of Amazon called Dilip Kumar. He was mm-hmm. the head of pricing and promotions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, he, he, he goes to spend a, uh, a year and a half working under Jeff Bezos as his technical advisor, mm-hmm. um, which basically means he sits under Jeff Bezos and you know, uh, takes all the meetings that he takes and learns from him, learns the way that Amazon works. He, he finishes this stint. He can't go back to pricing and promotions mm-hmm. because it's all been automated. <laughs> so what's he do? He doesn't leave the company. Basically, he's mandated, go find the most annoying part of shopping in real life Mm -hmm. and find out a way to solve it using technology. Mm -hmm. So the most annoying part, him and a bunch of other ex-retail people figure out, is checkout. People Mm -hmm. don't like waiting on the lines after they got all their stuff and, you know, having an awkward conversation. They want to take the stuff. They want to go. So they say, okay, we'll solve checkout. First thing they do is say, let's build a big vending machine, punch in your order. Some tubes will, you know, suck the product out. You'll go into your shopping cart and you'll be done. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, that doesn't really work. It kind of kicks the can down the curb. So instead they said, well, what if we took machine learning, uh, you know, computer vision yep. coming down from the ceiling with cameras and sensors and built a, short, built a store where the technology can figure out everything you take, no scanning, you just scan in with a QR code when you walk in, but you don't have to scan each item individually, just put it in your bag and walk out and then eventually Amazon will push you a receipt. Mm-hmm. And that's what ended up becoming Amazon Go, which is their experimental grocery store, which I think is going to blow up really soon. Mm-hmm. And so the story is, it's not that Jeff Bezos pushed a button and said, we're going to create Amazon Go, and that's how it's ha- that would ha- how it's it happened. It's that they tasked him to go figure exactly. out the problem to solve, which it's I think the, is fascinating. Totally. The culture that's about reinvention, mm-hmm. that's about taking employee ideas, not just having Bezos dictate what's going to happen, mm-hmm. and using technology to minimize execution work to make room for idea work, and that's really what's going to propel Amazon into the future. So when we talk about culture, we can think about perks, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, this, to me, is the most exciting thing about what a positive culture can be. Yeah, and the ability to invent, right? Uh, so somebody here asked, I think, a fascinating question. I got to go. What about the Chinese? <laughs> no, no. What about the Chinese companies? So it's yeah. hard to talk about the U.S. titans without right. talking about Tencent, Alibaba. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, uh, TikTok and, you know, and, and what's everything that's going on in video. So how would you think uh, if you had to write a book about the non-U.S. tech companies? What would you, I know you haven't done that. Yeah. But what would you assume? And kind of did you do, do any uh, juxtaposing or, uh, or thinking about uh, some of these titans outside of the U.S., particularly in mm-hmm. China, and how how they likely evolve their uh, 
uh, they're always day one cultures. Yeah. So, I mean, luckily, I don't have to write a book because there's already a fantastic book out about it um, by Kai Fu Lee. Oh, yes. Um, I used to work with Kai Fu. Yeah. Well, he is yeah. so smart. And yeah. I met him and Very interviewed smart. him for the book. Yeah. Um, and he, he writes, it's called AI Superpowers. It's mm -hmm. terrific. I recommend uh, people check it out after reading mine, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, I think for Chinese companies, what's central? Artificial intelligence. It's mm -hmm. big. Okay. So we talk a little bit about, I mean, in my book, I talk about how AI is central to these companies. It's central to Chinese companies. I think we can say, mm -hmm. you know, with pretty de high degree of certainty, AI is important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it can be a buzzword for some companies. Like mm -hmm. there was an iced tea company that said, we're going to call ourselves like the Long Island blockchain iced tea company <laughs> right. and stock went up. Yeah. And a lot of companies have done the same with for AI. AI. Of course, yeah. But just because companies are trying to brand themselves as AI companies without being AI companies doesn't mean that this isn't real. It's mm -hmm. real inside the US mm -hmm. and it's real inside China. And I think people should pay attention to it. The other thing Kaifu talks about is how they very frequently will copy and iterate mm -hmm. and do it real fast. Yeah. So again, this goes to the idea of if you think the advantages that you have are safe, mm -hmm. you're wrong because there's going to be a brazen company that's going to go out and copy and iterate over right, and over and do again. what you do better, right? Exactly. By the way, I think that yeah. part of the point you make in the book is there is no shame in copying. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you look at Instagram stories versus mm -hmm. Snapchat, one would say there's invention, can, invention can include copying and doing something better. Yeah, Kaifu, I asked Kaifu about it. So I was like, you know, because Facebook had, had copied story. Yep. And I was like, well, what do you think about Mark Zuckerberg and mm -hmm. the fact that he copies all the time? Mm -hmm. And he goes, look, like, how, do, how does anyone who plays music start? They right. copy Mozart right. and they copy Beethoven. Yeah, it's how start. you learn the act and the art. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, interesting. I think copying and then learning the essence of something yeah. and then figuring out how to take it one then further. Improve. I mean. Let's be clear. Google search. We all know where that came from yeah, or how that exactly. started. So and Google AdWords as another uh, as another matter of fact. Um, so uh, there's a question here about how do you know which company has the high? Do you know which company of the ones you mentioned in the book has the highest employee satisfaction rating by virtue of its oh. own employees? Or if not, do you have a guess? I don't know the answer to that. Let's eliminate a couple. I don't okay. believe it's Apple, mm -hmm. just given the fact that there are very few happy people there. Yep. Microsoft again is a change in culture, um, and then and then Google. I think people have been a little dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, oh God, I know where this is going, and it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be controversial mm -hmm. with Sundar's leadership. Although people are still pretty happy at mm -hmm. Google, uh, Amazon is pretty hard charging. You know, you have people that love it, but mostly they're looking towards what it will turn them into mm -hmm. versus the work there. So the answer mm -hmm. of the company that I think has the most satisfied employees. Yep. Believe it or not, Facebook. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'd love to see that data too, right? Uh, but I think that one of the things all the companies that you mentioned on, to the positive share in common, and I think you know I've observed, continue to observe about Facebook as well as Amazon and Google is they definitely all have a dog fooding culture where they mm -hmm. believe deeply in the power of their own products, right? That's like, right. To change the world. Mm -hmm. Google still has that. Amazon certainly has it. Facebook has it. And if you talk to employees in any of those companies, they still deeply believe. And again, dog food, the services themselves, yeah. right, within the company that they believe will change the world. And yeah, they're so I using think that's it. some I mean, essence. Yeah. As a Facebook reporter, I'm always trying to say, you know, if I see a Facebook employee, you know, to say, hey, let me take a look at that yellow Facebook app. Because they yeah, all have this yeah. version yes, of the Facebook yes. app. It's not blue. But it's, it's yellow. Yep. It's internal. It has yep. everything that's about to come. Yeah. And uh, so far, it's been tough to be able to take a look into, into one of those. Nobody's but showing you? If anybody out there wants to come hang out and show me the yellow app, you, you can find me. I, I love it. All right. So somebody else is asking, do you think Google has too much power over private data? You know, this question, uh, quintessential question of user data. And as mm. you know, this is the thing that Apple has rested its laurel upon. Mm -hmm. We are not all of them because we don't sell your user data. But this question is asking specifically about Google. Do you think it should be broken up? Uh, 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 this user wants to know. Well, I think they, without a doubt, have too much power over user data. Mm -hmm. I mean, the same with Facebook. Mm -hmm. Same with Apple, even though Apple's a bit more responsible in using it. Mm -hmm. And we should know why Apple is making this case because Facebook is a major Apple threat mm -hmm. because Apple has this lock-in with iMessage. Mm -hmm. And if people start using other messaging apps, people might not need iPhones. Mm -hmm. Who's built the best messaging apps outside of Apple? Mm -hmm. Facebook with WhatsApp and Messenger and Instagram. Um, so Microsoft also has a ton of user data. I don't know which one I'm forgetting. Google. Uh, Google, oh, Microsoft, Amaz Amazon. Oh, has, Amazon yes. is more user data than any Anybody, of these companies. Then, yeah, they Amazon, know what we buy. Yeah, Amazon so, has. So yes, I, I think that data. they have way, way too much power 
terms of the breakup question, I mean, I write in the book that it should be considered. Mm -hmm. um, again, like it's sort of like a wind over replacement model, mm -hmm. right? How uh, how better? How much better is the um, is the is the outcome from what we have today? Yeah, I think it can be done in a way that's better. For instance, you know, if you're a publisher, mm -hmm. you basically have Facebook and Google. They control your life. Mm -hmm. Let's say they broke up these companies into, let's say, Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. Google, YouTube. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now you would say, do you want access to my news? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you have to pay mm -hmm. right right now. You can't make that case because you're literally at the beck and call or the mercy of these companies. But if the suppliers had a little bit more agency, yeah. a little bit more choice, then they would be able to get a better deal for themselves. Yeah, I mean, look, the, I think the challenge for content publishers is it's a it's a two horse race. It's you know mm -hmm. Facebook and Google between them control seventy percent, sixty to seventy percent of the ad budgets in the country, yeah. which is which is remarkable. And um, if you're like a third party supplier, you're even more at the mercy of Amazon because. Oh, you know, yeah. where else are you going to sell products on the internet? And, and let's be clear, Amazon has never made the commitment that it won't use that data to fund its own private label businesses and other and, and yeah. other businesses well, it, as well. It did tell Congress that it wasn't going to use the data, and then a Wall Street Journal story recently said that, that it, it did. was. Yes, so, I, I don't know. I don't know. Big what shock. Could, yeah. <laughs> but they're going to have some answering to do about the what they told the U.S. Congress. Yeah, and I think generally marketplace marketplace uh, merchants would say it's such a conundrum to work with, with Amazon because at any point in time you feel like they're watching all your SKU turns mm -hmm. and seeing what's selling best. Yeah. Um, while, what, by the it, way, you're paying subsidized right. rates to be in their warehouse and if you're, you know, I mean, okay. it's an... Now I get to ask a question to you. Sure. So how nefarious do you think it is inside Amazon in terms of um, competing with their own suppliers on the marketplace? Well, I think, well, first of all, I'll come back to this point which you made in the book, which I agree with. Having lived in some of these cultures, Amazon and Google specifically, though, as I said, admittedly, Google for a much longer time than Amazon, and having obviously many colleagues who went to Facebook, less or so Microsoft, but I feel like I do know people at all these companies. Mm -hmm. What I believe generally to be true, oh, and, I, and my general counsel at StubHub was from, uh, had come to us from Amazon uh, most recently and boomeranged back, as it's called. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I would say is, I don't believe that any of these places people wake up wanting to be nefarious, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think what I believe is that the offshoot or the consequence of a culture where you can invent anything is like, why wouldn't I invent it? If there's a better way to do something, why wouldn't I do it without necessarily thinking about the downstream repercussions or the responsibility you have to do that responsibly? Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. So do I think Amazon Amazonians yeah. wake up nefariously thinking yeah. about like Dr. Evil? I don't actually. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that one of the things that comes as an offshoot of this culture of extreme invention mm -hmm. is that if you can do something and it's smarter or better or more automated... Why wouldn't you? It's almost the temptation to the opposite. Like, mm -hmm. why would you constrain yourself? Is there a way that changes? Sorry, look, you yes. got into a conversation with a reporter now. No, I, yeah. Is there a way that changes? Yeah. Yeah, to your point, you know, I'm not sure. One would have said that pre-COVID, to your point, yeah. um, there was a significant backlash. Now, whether that backlash had any regulatory teeth is its own question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Is it possible for people to self-police to an extreme degree? I, I, I genuinely don't know the answer. Yeah. I do think there'll be attempts, but are they serious attempts if there's mm -hmm. no enforcement? Not really. Know. Yeah, this yeah, is why I, I think we have to have a well-funded regulatory body. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, look, it's a, it's a question in and, in and unto itself. But as I said, I think it really comes from uh, this place we talked about, which, I, which is sort of this culture of extreme invention, mm -hmm. right? I think if you talk to people at Facebook, I think they genuinely wake up believing, like, most of what we do is for the good. We are mm. connecting people around the world. Like, to your point, I think Facebook employees are probably pretty happy because they believe deeply in that mission. And in fact, the platform does all that, but it also does a lot of other things. That's right. And so I think it's this question of responsibility mm -hmm. is the fundamental question. And then to your point, is there any enforcement that helps you see what you don't see for yourself? Right. With any teeth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I think there's that is like, the open question. Yeah. And inside Facebook, you know, I talk about this in the book, but there might be some change brewing. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, they, they are this like very tightly wound, tightly knit culture, right? Where, where things, uh, where feedback really matters. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that they've been listening to techno optimists all this time and started believing their own hype. Mm -hmm. And I think they realized they had a problem there. And there's a section in the book 
called New Inputs that talks about people with adversarial mindsets, mm-hmm. you know, externalists and, and academics. And and right. villainous, like thinking yeah. about those actors. Yeah. So they, they brought in like all these people with different backgrounds, not folks that you typically find here in San Francisco, but, you know, journalists and, and ex-spies even um, that they've now plugged into their feedback culture. Mm-hmm. And so I think that Facebook employees are starting to have their eyes open that not everything is going to be for the good. Mm-hmm. How much have they taken that message to heart? I don't know, but it's certainly improvement from what existed beforehand. Well, one of the things you've identified in the book and otherwise is Zuckerberg is a learner, an extreme learner, mm-hmm. if ever there is one. I mean, I yeah, think and a is. survivalist. Yes, yeah, survivalist, learner, uh, feedback loop kind of, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know, uh, pro. It's, I mean, he really does, I think, uh, just has to have an incredible ability to keep learning. Mm-hmm. Um, how that's, how that, how that plays out in terms of Facebook's products is a different question, but I think there's yeah. no doubt that Mark Zuckerberg is extra- exceptionally thoughtful about continuing to sort of uh, build these feedback loops for himself. All yeah. right, so we're going to end on uh, a couple of fun questions. So okay, you start great. on this journey to uh, write the book. First of all, what compelled it? Was it in the era? You know, books take a long time to get out, right? Mm-hmm. Was this was this idea originally born of the era where sort of you know, you had effectively a different uh, tech company at, in Washington every week. Like, what led to the birth of this book? Yeah, it was It was really, the whole process began in 2017 when I met Mark Zuckerberg for the first time. Mm-hmm. And the typical CEO briefing for a reporter is you sit there and the CEO lectures you for about 25 minutes and then five minutes at the end, you know, if you haven't made any grimaces because the PR person is yes. looking at your <laughs> face, they say, hey, do you want to ask a question? Right? Mm-hmm. With Zuckerberg, it was totally opposite. He, we, I came in there with my bureau chief, Matt Honan, and he initially said, I want your feedback on what we're doing. That's, he seemed to care more about what we thought than about selling us the product itself. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't know if this was like a weird sales tact or, <laughs> tactic or something, so I started asking people inside Facebook's orbit, what's the deal with the feedback thing? Right. And they told me, yeah, this is standard in the culture. There's posters around the, uh, around the headquarters that say feedback is a gift. Uh, there's the training that I attended that I go one or two days and new employees are strongly encouraged to attend and do in great numbers and major meetings end with requests for it. Mm-hmm. And this is very different from the conception I have of what a top CEO does. You know, again, coming in with the Steve Jobs model, I thought the CEO just gets up on the yeah. you know table with the microphone and says, all right, everybody, we're doing this. Now go execute my idea. But it turns out it's very different inside Facebook. I also had this background in, um, in industrial and labor relations. It's what I studied in college. And so we, learned, we took like, uh, classes on human resources, organizational behavior, you know, what power inside an organization means, how people use it. And so I had heard, learned about the different evolutions of the workplace since the industrial economy. And I just looked at what was happening in Facebook and then started asking similar questions of Google and Microsoft and Amazon and said, you know what? We might be making our way into a new form of work. And to me, this requires going in depth and investigating it and writing a book about it. And in the end, I do come to the conclusion that, yeah, we're living in a completely different workplace uh, than we ever have before. The tech giants have realized it. That's why they're lapping the economy. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, not yet. And I think that it was important for me as a reporter to get this information out there because we have two jobs, Mm -hmm. you know, afflict the powerful, right? Do all the accountability Mm -hmm. reporting in the world to make sure that companies aren't getting away with the bullshit that they would like to get away with. Yep. And then empower the afflicted. Give the people that are competing with the powerful mm-hmm. the tools to be able to do it effectively. So I do think that by co-opting some of the good elements of the tech giant's culture, the rest of the companies in the economy will be able to get better and bigger. And all of a sudden, we'll have a more competitive, more even economy and a better society as a result. Um, well, I will, I will say the other phrase I like from you, I might adopt it myself, is mm. techno-optimist. I think I yeah. may be a techno-optimist, <laughs> which probably is not a surprise for a Silicon Valley CEO. Um, all right, one last question. Any, any big surprises? What was the biggest surprise in, in this sort of journey you've been on to write the book? I mean, the biggest surprise was honestly how, um, how advanced the automation is. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you yeah, know, the AI application is it's just unbelievable. And I think it's, companies. it's accelerating so fast and people don't appreciate it. I mean, we've had some other news to pay attention to recently, mm-hmm. but uh, their companies are really putting this stuff into production in a way that they weren't before mm-hmm. in a way that like, you know, you read it in a news story and you say, oh, that's cute. Like an AI can play a video game mm-hmm. or an AI can play go, right, or exactly. right, it's not going to affect my life. Chess, right. It is really starting to affect people's lives and their work lives in a real way. Mm-hmm. 
And I knew it was going on in the tech giants, but I, I'm starting to see it happen, you know, many other companies mm -hmm. elsewhere. I went to this automation conference that people can read about in the introduction, and I looked around at the type of companies that were there. Automotive, insurance, mm -hmm. finance. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was amazing. You know, retail. Mm -hmm. Everybody's starting to use this stuff. And I think it's going to profoundly change the way we work. And, and controversially, I think it's going to be for the better. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to end up losing, you know, tremendous amount of jobs. We're going to end up just changing the way we work. And okay, it's on our government and our education system to prepare people for this world. But ultimately, I think it's going to be a lot more rewarding and fulfilling for the people in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and, and certainly from the book, you give plenty of examples of where people go on not to lose their jobs, but uh, to find a second or third effectively vocation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in some cases, in most cases within uh, those same companies. Well, listen, I think with that, we've come to the end of our time. Super fun to do this. This was great. Yeah, thank you for doing it with us. Thank you. Um, a huge thank you to you again, Alex Kantrowitz, who was the author of Always Day One how the tech giants intend to stay on top forever. And we encourage you to pick up your copy at a local independent bookstore. Uh, we also want to express our appreciation to everyone who's joining us online. And once again, I'm Sue Kinder St. Cassidy, and it's been so fun to host this virtual version of the Commonwealth Club. Thank you. <laughs>